Hey, all right. See that? Yep. Right up there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start that again. Okay, you're in black. Stand by. Want to get? Want to get a shot of me first here? So, as I roll over and show it to the stuff. Well, can you move over to the camera? Yeah. That's good enough. Okay, good. Hello, I'm Joe D'Agostino, and I'm going to teach you everything I know about the Chiron 4, which is over there. Chiron 4 is a character. Oh, and Bob is going to produce and direct camera. this. Bob's on camera. And today, <laughs> and Mike Slepian is, is in here for annoyance value, purely for annoyance value. Today is, uh, yeah, today is February 11th, 1985, and we are going to discuss how to use the Chiron character generator to do basic stuff with it. Now the first, <laughs> the first stuff you got to do with it is you got to turn it on. We're going to assume the system as such, this room, is on. If the room is on, there are an assortment of buttons and switches to turn the Chiron on. The first and most important is the main power supply, which is over here. See that? It says Chiron. It's at the bottom. You turn it on, thusly. A little switch goes up. There's another switch up here. It's not ordinarily left off, but check it anyway. It's the, uh, the other switch, and it goes on. Then you come over here, and you have to turn on the keyboard. And to turn on the keyboard, there's a little button over here. And it's a push button, and you turn that on push it in and this will light up little red indicators which you can't see too well but there they are okay <laughs> take a message please take a message we're in production please <laughs> well excuse me and then you turn on the monitor okay now what you get at that stage is this you get this assortment of colored lines on the monitor and that tells you that everything's on and has to be on, almost everything's on and has to be on. There's one more thing that has to be on, the disk drive. Okay, the disk drives are over here. There are two disk drives and there's an on-off switch. You turn them on, they make a lot of noise. Okay, you don't need the matches for the Chiron, but you may want to consider. Okay, now you take, now you need, now what you have here is an on Chiron but it's dumb. It doesn't have a program in it. It is inert and won't do a thing. You need the program disk. The program disk, there it is, will say composite program. Macro. Macro, <laughs> yeah. Okay, composite program, number one. Uh, there is another one in here, I think. But the point is, it has to say program, not uh, message disk. And it has this stuff on it. The program disk contains the information the Chiron needs to become a Chiron. And you put it in disk drive number one. Disk drive number one is the far one. One, two. One, two. You turn it on automatically. Right, okay, well, yeah. When you turn the thing first, when you first turn it on, one, there's a little light down there, but one will be uh, default. Okay, now the disk is in the drive. It's still a dumb Chiron because only one command will work at this point, and it is this. Okay, the upper left the keyboard, it says exec, E-X-E-C. You say exec. When you say exec, what you get is, a, you'll hear the disk drive click, and you'll get a little prompt down here, and it'll say exec. You can just barely see it at this stage. Okay, it says exec and it wants to know what program do you want to execute. You want to execute the program called L for load. Okay, you press L and it says on the prompt line it'll say loading. So now it says, <laughs> yeah, let's try to, get, try to get that back, Bob. Go back, into the, go back into the prompt. Okay, you've pressed exec, you press L and it says, uh, there. 
Now it gives you this prompt. Enter the ID of the font you want to load or E. E means end when you're done ending it. And it gives you these slash marks. And there are six holes. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's room for six fonts to go into the, the box. Now you may say, well, how do I know what fonts to put in there? Well, you take the font sheet, okay? Now it may look like two sheets, but actually it's supposed to be one sheet. It, it tends to be two sheets more often than it's one sheet. And on, on that, is the assortment of fonts you can choose from. You can only choose six, any six, but you have to choose. And they are a variety of type sizes and type styles. And uh, the way it works over here is on the left is a number, and that is the ID number that this thing has just asked for. When it said enter ID, it wants to know which number the label of the font. Okay, American Typewriter Bold is number 55, Bolt is number 43, okay, Cheltenham's number 58, and so forth. Down here it says TV scan lines, and that gives you an idea of how big the font is going to be on the screen. Okay, a 30 scan lines is bigger than 28, 46 is even bigger yet. There, there, yeah, 48 is pretty big. I, forget, I don't know what the biggest is we have here. I guess it's a, uh, yeah, it's this Helvetica, which is uh, 58. Okay, that's a pretty big font. It'll take. The smallest one's down. And the smaller ones are like 18. It's also Helvetica. We're very fond of Helvetica here because it's pretty safe. And uh, you can pretty much use Helvetica with impunity and not be accused of having a, a bad typeface. Um, Okay, so now let's pick six of these things of varying size and style. I'm going to pick Helvetica Bold number six. Okay, now how do I load it? Well, I go over here to the keyboard, the numeric keypad, and that is where it wants the number, this number. It wants this number in here, so I'm going to put six. And then I, I have to say, where do I, over here, Bob? Where do I want to put that font number six? I want to put it in hole number one. And I do that, and it says it says loading font data up on top on the, on the line, and then it says six. OK, there's now a little six there telling me that I've put the font number six into hole number one. Let's do that again. That was such fun. I'm going to put the font called number three. OK, here's a font called number three. Three. I'm going to put it in the hole number two. And sure enough, this is loading font data. Yep, there it is. Came up number three. Oh, let's put the font called number 28, which is serif, gothic. 28. Put that in number. Put that in number three. Stay wide on the, on the whole thing. OK. A little wider. Yeah, just okay. include the prompt line. Yeah, there you go. Yes, Not, Okay, sorry, you're the director. Yeah. And finally, <laughs> but who cares? 40 goes into font 4. You get real fast at this eventually. 21 goes into font 5. Oh, that's a nice idea. Yeah. This will work. Hey, that's not bad. Yeah. Get that close. Okay. I can dig it. And we need one more. Real, 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 real. <laughs> Fang. Fang. Down, down, Fang, down. Uh, 58, okay, font called number 58, 58, font number 6. The prompt now says, font load complete. And that's telling you, okay, you have now picked six of these fonts and put them into the six holes. Now what? I mean, it's not, it prompts you, but not real completely. It doesn't tell you what it needs next. What it needs next is everything else. It has the fonts, now it needs to know colors and, and other junk to be a Chiron. And the way you do that is you say exec, M, okay, exec, there's, it wants to know another program now. The first one you picked was L, this time you pick M, as in murder. And it says loading, and it's, a, and it's about it. And then you just sort of sit back and wait. And, ah, that's the prompt you want. It says ready, one, white, font one. Now the 06, if you recall, that was the, num that was the 
number of the font we put in the hole number one, in the hole number one here, as we put font six. So what this is telling you is whenever you select a different font over here, that changes. Font two has the thing called three in it. Font three has number 28 in it. Font four has number 40 in it. Font five has number 21 in it. Font six has number 58 in it. Okay. If you had 24 fonts, you can only use six at a time. You can only use six at a time, right. What happens if I want to change? You have to go back and reload. That whole rigmarole we just went through, exec, L, and that whole shtick. Now, there is a shortcut for all this. At this stage, we're ready to start typing, but we're going to go back and do it again. And here's how. Here's why. Because there's an automatic way. You don't have to actually pick each font each time and tell it. You don't have to do that rigmarole of tap, tap, one, two, three. There's a, there's a preset way of doing that. And the way you do it is, OK, the disk is in the drive, right? Go over here and say exec L. I'm going to ask it to load up again. It gives me the same prompt I had before, ID or E. There's a thing called auto font load. And on the disk, let me go over here for a minute. Okay, on the disk, it says auto font load. There we go. Okay. What it tells you, what this little graph tells you is, if you select auto font load number one, you will get these fonts. You'll get number one, number three, number six, number 12, 14, 17. Okay, and that's the order font one, font two, font three. So if we were to go down here and select auto font number four, it would, without us doing anything, it would put 55, 58, 52, 40, 17, 35. It would put those in, in the font holes where they had to be. So let's do that. I said exec. And it asks me for an auto font load now. Where do I tell it? One, I tell it here on the alpha pad, not over here, not on the numeric pad. Hold on, flash Amateur cameraman here. Okay. You, you tell it that with this set of numbers, not that set of numbers. Okay. So I'm going to say font load number two. Disk drive down. Hmm. Okay. Got to put the disc back in, Siri Bob. <clears throat> Two. And it says, look at the prompt here. It says auto load, and it's doing it all by itself. I don't have to do a thing. It's put 14, it put 17 in. Now it's going to put another one in. 10, now it's going to say loading. It does that exec M thing, you know, the other program. It's one-stop shopping. It's a wonderful yeah. thing. And then it says ready. And it you're does an automatic exec M. It does automatic exec cam. All you do is exec L and give it the auto load, and it runs through not only L, but M as well. Now I have six fonts in there, not of my own choosing, but of somebody else's choosing. And uh, we're all set to go. All right? Now we don't, see this? Don't need that anymore. You can put it over here or somewhere else. Now, let's type. <coughs> <laughs> okay, Mike wants to get off camera. Mike, Mike, yeah, here. There's Mike. Mike's on camera. We, we don't really know what he's doing or why, but he's doing it. Okay. Now then, we're now set to type. Let's, uh, we have this thing arranged here so that you can see what I type as I type. Okay. If I were to go a little higher there, Mom. Right, you just type and you got letters. It's wonderful. Over here is the erase key. And the erase key is a wonderful thing to know about because when you hit it, it erases the whole screen. If I select font one and type, I get, let me put this up here. Okay, I get font one. If I select font two, it comes out a little bigger. Font 3 is a little smaller. Font 4. Font 5. Font 6. Ooh, a little tiny font. There we go. That's the 18 scan line. That's the 18 scan line. That's about as small as you want. In fact, you don't want to ever use that font. That font really sucks. Okay. That's now, good. well. In caps? In, ca in caps? Yeah, maybe. It's usable. Depends. Okay, when you hit erase, it all goes away. Now, one important thing to know about here is that each, the Chiron space 
the, when you're composing, oh, and when you're, whenever you're not using the disk drive, <laughs> as I've just been reminded, you turn the disk drive off, okay? Let's, let's emphasize that here. We want to go T, U, R, turn, disk drive off. <laughs> when not using in use. Okay, turn disk drive off when not in use. Remember that, very important. Okay. The Chiron space consists of lines, individual lines. Um, let's take a look at the cursor, Bob. In fact, let me bring it down. Okay, yeah. okay the, this is the cursor. The cursor is your friend. Treat it with respect, it'll save your life. It. Uh, that's the cursor tells you where you are. Now, down here are the cursor move keys. And when you hit up, the cursor goes up. And when you hit down, the cursor goes down. And thus, like that. It consists of up, down, left, right, home. Brings it to the extreme upper left. OK, so you can have the cursor go down there. And home brings it back to upper left. Uh, and that's all we'll worry about for the moment. These other, these other things come later. Uh, there's another move, there's another key here called new line. And what that does is it jumps the cursor down. It's like a okay. return on a type Yeah, it's like a return. You hit new line and it comes back to the next line. Down, down, down. Okay. Home. The cursor size will vary depending on the font you're using. If you select a font and then hit erase, the cursor size will change. It'll reset the whole page to be the size of that font. OK, let's do this again. If I go 1, erase. Now watch the cursor size. OK, it's a little smaller now. Why do I care about cursor size? OK, cursor size tells you the size of the line that you have to play with. It, um, it helps you space type. It's, it's important for spacing type, and here's why. Say I have a very big cursor size. Okay, there's a big cursor size. And if I just go and I pick a small font and start typing, and then I hit new line and I type again, that's as close as the letters are going to get. Okay, I can't really move them but, but if I had the right font size in the first place and I had erased the page and reset the lines to that size, now I can type and I can hit new line and I can get it much closer together. All right. That's, it's That's text management. It's, a way, it's spacing. It's a way of getting the spacing together. Right. Um, now, notice this is the smallest font I've got right now. If, and I'm on font six. If I were to select a bigger font within the same line and continue typing, that big font takes over. So right. now that new line. drop that down. Okay, and if I hit new line, now if I hit new line, I'm still all I did was reset that line when I when I selected the bigger type size. Okay. Only that line has the big size now. Because if I jump the cursor up, it's smaller, right? See, it's small, it's small, it's small. Only on this line is it big. Now it's small again. Now it's small again. Okay, so I could Okay, now I had the other font selected there, so now I've reset that one line. Okay, so you can have varying lines within a page. If I were to go over there and uh, there's another way, well, okay. You select, you select your font, just type one character, that's all it takes, bang. That one line is now real big. All the others are still small. Whatever you erase to, sets the whole page. Okay, so if I go font one and erase, now the whole thing is set to one size again. All right. What are we going to do next here? The erase, the cursor always went to the top. And when you erase, the cursor always goes home. It's just a, uh, home does not, you know, home by itself just brings the cursor home without changing anything. But when you erase, it also brings it home and it resets all the lines. Uh, cursor, cursor move, font, line, size, cursor size, relation, erase. 
Okay, let's do, let's, we're coming, coming to the end of lesson one here. We're going we're gonna to type, and this is what you should now do if you are watching this tape and are able to get in and play with the thing intermittently. You should do everything you've seen so far. Turn it on, exec, and all that stuff. Um, let's put somebody's name up, because this is a bare minimum. You need to be able to do that. You need to be able to get a lower third across the bottom of the screen, right? So you do that by saying, what are the fonts I have available? Well, select number one, hit new line, select number two, new line number three, new line number four, new line number five, new line six. Uh, oh, I guess I like, uh, I'm gonna put the guy's name in number four and his title in font number three, right? Okay, if I'm going to have two different kinds of fonts on the same page, I want to set the page to the smaller one, generally speaking. Set it to the smaller one. The larger one will take care of itself as soon as you type it. If you, have, if you set it to the larger one, the smaller one is going to be swimming around like we saw before. So I'm going to pick number three, hit erase. The whole thing is now reset to that size. Skip down to almost the lower third. Go back to number four and type the guy's name. R. Bub. Okay, now I skip the cursor down to the next line. If I were to just type without changing the font, that line would also be reset. I'm going to go back to the font 3, which was what we set the whole page for, and we're going to call him Senior B. B. Engineering. How do I move it to centered? Well, I guess we need to deal with that now, huh? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Positioning. Yeah, yeah. I was going to save it for the next lesson. Um, you jump up a couple lines here. You hit new line, bring the cursor back down. Uh, up here, this little group of keys, there's something called center row and uh, center page. If you just hit center row, only that row jumps to the middle. Cursor jumps down to the next line, center row, and there you go. Yeah. There's your lower third. Okay. Uh, stop the tape and go to your workbooks. And <laughs> <laughs> What's that line on the outside of this thing? Okay. What? What line on the outside of what thing? What's that? Line. Why is there a line here? Oh, oh, right. This, uh, <laughs> this screen, this is the, the compose screen, okay? The only thing that, as you can see, the only thing that makes it to the final program is the type. But all these prompts don't uh, go out to the rest of the system. This line is the safe area, and you cannot type beyond it. For one thing, the cursor won't let you. you. If you try to go left, it brings you back over here. All right, now you can go off to the left a little bit, and you'll come back down on the right. Essential area. Yeah, essential area. Right. Safe area. Okay, safe area. Whatever. Uh, I'm going to hit I'm going to erase this here. Okay. You can type a, well, let's go on to lesson two. Oh. Hi, welcome back. Now we're going to go on to lesson two. Lesson two, we'll get into all that stuff. Uh, yeah, safe area. Let me write that down. Make it down. Safe area. Okay. Colors. Their default. Yeah. Their default colors set up when you do the exec M part of the thing. Um, when you do the exec M part of the thing, you get pretty much your primary colors fully saturated. So if you hit and it comes up white all the time, and all the things you've seen so far are white. If you select red, that changes to red, and if you type, you get red. And if you select magenta, and if you select blue, hey, NTSC, you know, cyan, yellow, 
green. Better? Okay. Green. That's not green. That's not green. Uh, white. Okay. So that's how you get colors. You can mix colors within a row. As you see, you can have individual characters, but to do that, you have to change it each time. You have to go, you have to say uh, red. Oh, here, wait a minute. You have to go red, H, white. E, blue, L, cyan, L, yellow, O. Fine, you can have, uh, let's do that in the bigger font. Let's select the biggest font we got and demonstrate that again. Red, H, E, blue, L, cyan, L, yellow, O. Okay, hello. Now these are fully saturated colors, and for the most part, the only one that's really useful, the only two that are really useful are the yellow, and the cyan uh, and the white sometimes. But otherwise, uh, and we'll get in later to how you get other colors up there. There's more to choose from. Uh, the blue, 64. Generally speaking, the blue is not so hot. And uh, the red, they're really fully saturated and don't survive too well. Um, Inside letters is fill information, all right. But solid field, no. No. Okay. Okay, here is. Uh, that's the color buttons. Okay, let's do everything in yellow from here on out. We're going to do it in yellow and we're going to do it in font 4. So erase the font 4, reset the page, come back down, and we're going to now demonstrate the, uh, this group of buttons up here. There are four buttons. Delete row, okay. Delete row, insert row, delete character, insert character. Here's how they work. You go and you type, say you got some stuff on the screen. Uh, so you have delete. New line. Delete. Okay, new line. Insert. Row. <laughs> new line. Insert. <laughs> character. Okay. Well, now I say to myself, uh, self, this is too low in the frame. I'd like to move the whole thing up, but rather than have to retype it all, I can just bring the cursor up here, one row above. Well, let's, let's illustrate it this way. I say, oops, I typed that twice, and I didn't want to type it twice. Okay, delete row. Why don't I just delete the row? And I press the button, and I delete the row. Everything else jumps up. Okay. Now I can come back down here and say D-L-E-T-E, delete character. C-H-A-R-A-C-T. Okay, delete character. Now I have all each of the four I need. If I wanted to move the whole thing up, I could bring the cursor to a blank row. It'll delete a blank row and move the whole thing up. Okay, I'll do that again. Cursor is up above. Hit delete row. Boom. So too, you can insert a row by hitting insert row. You can insert a blank row above or below above or below your text, or you can insert it in between. It always inserts above. Okay, I've just inserted a blank row. I can delete that row now, skip this down, insert one here, delete it, insert, delete. Okay, that's pretty obvious. Character works the same way. You position the cursor, you insert a character, you can insert the character several characters, and then you go back and type. Oops. Uh, and tighten it up. You can insert another character. But you say to yourself, wait a minute, now it's spelled wrong. Well, go back and delete them. Okay. Delete, delete. delete. Um, that's pretty handy for uh, gross movements of text on the page. For instance, if you're typing somebody's name, you erase. Yeah, R, Bub, um, Senior, B, P, and then you can say, well, go home and just insert row, pop, 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 
Now you've got it down to where it needs to be. Hit center page, and the whole thing is centered. Okay. Suppose I don't want it exactly centered. Suppose I want it to the left, far above. Far above. Okay. You can not all the way to the left. Just, I just want a little bit. That. Well, you can delete character a little bit until. Well, okay. Do it this way. Uh, I guess I'm leaning out the. How do I position? It? Yeah. You could. Instead of hitting center row, center page, you can insert character just a little bit until you get it to where you, you know, roughly where you want it. Go to jump down a line. Keep it there. And there, and I have a nice little stack there. You would never do this for a lower third, but if you had, say, a bunch of bullets, let me just take delete row, delete row, delete row. Come back down here. All right, Bub, senior VP. I G M A Sigma. And then come back here and insert character. Okay, so you can put you can compose on the screen gross movements using those. Okay, now I know what you're driving at, though, Bob. You want to know about shifting rows and characters. Usually, usually that's. Usually I'm not sure I want to get into that just yet. Uh, you want the correct way to shift. No, I wouldn't. I would think. I wouldn't want to shift. Well, here's why. Uh, okay, erase. I'm going to go new line, new line, new line, new line. R, bub. Okay. I'm going to skip the cursor up one. Hit new line. Okay. Now I got a variety of things I can do with that. I can either hit center row, center page. I can insert character to move it back and forth. Okay, but the, char the cursor right now is on the first character. If I hit center row, I've now created a space between the left-hand edge and the first character. Well, that space does not contain a bunch of little cursor characters like this one. Okay, see, I can I can skip that cursor over, and that's just wonderful. But if I go up a line, I've got one space, and then this giant, that's the cursor. Okay, that whole white thing is, represents one character. Wow. And now I have... I don't have so much flexibility in what I can do with it. If I delete that character, that whole thing jumps all the way over, right? Delete character, bang. Yeah. So if you insert character, you have more space to make fine adjustments with just that kind of move, just hitting. Okay. okay. Now there's another thing called shifting rows and shifting characters, and that's for the f super fine movement. That's for really tucking and, and nipping things. And that's back down here with the um, cursor move keys. I'm gonna I'm going to hit new line. I'm going to type a few more things here. Senior B P. Okay. Okay, senior VP is uh, not spaced properly. So I'm going to take the cursor, put it on the period here. The cursor is now sitting on this period. I'm going to hold down shift character. I'm going to press the cursor left arrow and watch that period. And see how it's going underneath the P? Little tiny incremental movements. Okay, now if I take my finger off that and hit this, the cursor now jumps off the period, moves over to the P, yeah, and I can, we don't, see that. we don't see that, but I can open it up. Now I can go the other direction, hold down shift character, move it to the right. And then I can do that again, take my finger off, jump the cursor over to that period, hold down shift character, press that, and tuck the period under the V. Let me see that on the big screen. Okay, see what happens there? Now let's... Yeah, go, go in on this, and I'll do that whole sequence again. Okay, I'm going to delete that row. I'm going to type senior. See, what happens is the cursor is a vertical space, and it puts a character in there. As much, it takes as much space as it needs to fill that, for that character, but it doesn't do uh, kerning. It doesn't tuck characters underneath each other or anything like that. So if I type a V... Okay, there's that horizontal line, man. It, it's ready to put anything I want in that next space, but it was not going to put anything underneath the V. So I put a period there. It's not spaced properly. If I put a P here, it took it right from the edge of the period. You know, it's, it's too tight. Okay. And then same with that period. So now I'm going to hold, I'm going to move the cursor back, hold down shift character. While holding shift character, press the cursor arrow, and there it goes. Take off shift character, jump, push the cursor alone, and that moves it to the P. 
and open that up a little bit, hold down shift character, and press the right cursor arrow. You can do this forever. Then okay. jump it over to the period and tuck that under there. And that looks nicer. Okay, and that's how it should look. Uh, the various fonts, as you pick up a various font, different fonts have different characteristics as to how they come up on the screen and how much nipping and tucking they need. And you get uh, you get to know them after a while. For instance, I would I would go up here and I would open up the U and the B on Bub a little bit. Just shift character. Shift character. Yeah. Take the cursor over to the period here. Hold down shift character and then hit the right arrow and open that up a little bit. Okay, having done that, you can still do all the other stuff to it. You can still center the row. Okay, this internal relationship is the same. It stays the way you, you, you either open it up or you close it down, but when you hit shift row, it's fine. I, you know, I, I adjusted this and I can hit shift row, or center row rather. Okay, it centers the row and it didn't touch the work I did on nipping and tucking that. It's a space. Okay, keeps the spacing. However, it does still see giant cursor space. Yep. Okay, same same here. Another giant cursor space. Uh, the cursor characteristics are kind of funky. They uh, when you're on a character and you hit shift character, when you shift it to the left, everything follows. Okay. So I'm holding down shift character and I'm pressing the arrow. And the whole line is going. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm compressing this cursor space. Oops. See, it gets smaller as you do that. And what happens is if that was a normal, you get to a point where the space disappears. Let me illustrate that thusly. I'm going to, OK, when you shift to the left, everything follows. When you shift to the right, only the right follows, you open it up. So you open it up by shifting to the right. Okay, there is a true overlap here where I can keep shifting and the two characters are overlapping, but they never really truly overlap. You never get to the point where 100% of the cursor space, the character space is overlapped because what happens is eventually it disappears. The one on the left goes there. See, the first B disappeared. Now if I keep doing this, I'm eventually going to cause that period to dis disappear. There it goes. And I can now rub out the R as well. Ah, 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 ah. OK. So that's happening not only with characters, but that's happening technically with these invisible spaces too. Um, if I kept shifting this thing over, that space would eventually <coughs> compress and disappear. Now I'm going to show you another shortcut. Any keystroke you execute on the Chiron keyboard, any keystroke at all, can be repeated. Instead of me doing this, tack, 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 instead of having to do that all day, a button over here called repeat. Okay? Repeat. Repeat. Right there on the left. Let's get rid of this here. Okay. It's the repeat button. So if I go to, oh, say, uh, the home position and I hit the character R, and then I hold on to repeat, it goes R, it just, see, look, one hand free, I can do anything I want with it, and the R just goes until I take up the repeat button. R, repeat, okay. It'll do that with anything, it'll do it with, uh, oh, it'll do it with uh, shift row, for instance, H, H, I, shift row. Okay, we talked about shift character, shift row is similar. First of all, I'm gonna shift character by I'm going to hold down the shift character button here. Hold that down. Open up that word a little bit here. Okay. Now, if I hit shift row, a whole row, okay, shift row. Okay, instead of doing that, having I've do done that sequence once. I only have to do it once, I can hold down repeat, and it'll do it for me. Which ways can I shift row? Well, I can shift row left if I wanted. I hold on repeat and have it shift left. I could also shift row down. And now I can shift the row down. I cannot 
shift the row up too far because I'll show you why. Crunch. Okay, you see it sort of scrunches up there. Here's what happens. The Chiron sort of has uh, unforgiving barriers on the left and on the top. General rule of thumb is that you can shift things down and to the right. You can screw around with it. But on the left and on the top, it, uh, it has walls. Um, for instance, if I shift row to the right, hold down repeat here, I'm shifting row to the right, it's just going to stop. Okay, it doesn't like it. I'm still holding it down, but it's saying no, no further. That's the invisible wall. If I shift row to the, to the, I'm sorry, left. If I shift it to the right, if I shift row to the right, this is another reason you don't use this to center pages or to center things, because it's, it's slow. It's comparatively slow. Okay, oh, there it goes. Bye-bye. See, as it disappears off the line, a safe area line, it, it'll let you take it all the way off the screen. However, it's also losing them. At some point, it's saying it, it vanishes. Yeah, now, right. if I take it back, no, only a few of them are back. The F is there, the T is there, but nothing else. Okay. So there is sort of a no man's land off this way. It says uh, only a few. Really, it only allows you to have two or three characters there. Okay, I can shift it to the right, and it's going to go one character, two characters, three characters, shift to the right, and how many survived? Yep, they were all there. It doesn't matter. Okay, erase. Uh, so you can say, how do I position, what's the best way to position something on the whole screen? Well, start in the top row. Uh, if you say, top row, shift row down, hold down repeat, and fine, now I've got the whole screen at my disposal, I can put it pretty much anywhere in the whole screen, shift row up, just do that once and hold repeat, and I can do that. Here's another little important conceptual thing you need to know, okay, that's the top row, and here's uh, Second row. Third row. Fourth row. Whoops. Row. Okay. I got the cursor up on the second row. Hit shift, hold down shift row. Down, hit repeat. There is nothing in there, okay? There is no space. You cannot address that space. When you open it up like that, this is still the top row, this is still the second row, and you can't get in here, and here's why. Watch the cursor. If I push the arrow up, it goes up here. I can't get the cursor into that space. When you open up a row like that, that's dead. That's DMZ. Yeah. That's still the second row. That's still the first row. That's still the second row. That's still the third. That's the fourth. That's the fifth. But no dice in there. So you go down to the second row, and this is the same with new line. If I hit new line, the cursor jumps over here, and I can bring the characters. Now I can hit shift row and close that up again. Crunch. Okay, see how they scrunch up a little bit there? That's, they don't overlap. Rows don't overlap. Characters overlap, but rows, rows do not. Now this Shifting row stuff is sort of important when you've got uh, different size. That in conjunction with the different size fonts will help you space things nicely. Let's get erase here. If I had, uh, let's see, let me erase to the smaller font. If I go R, bub, pick smaller font three and say, Senior, B, B. I can tuck that a little bit. I can hit shift row and move that up just one or two and really pull it together if I had to. It depends on whether there's any, oh, well, here's why. Okay. If you had somebody's, if you had anything with a descender in it, a name with a, a G or a Y or something like that, and that's going to push that next row down a little bit, and you can compensate for that by using shift row. 
the idea being to not let too much, the idea being to group type. Uh, whether or not you have type composition skills is beyond the scope of this project, but we will uh, deal with that later. Okay, what next? Safe area, oh, okay, tabs. Tabs are similar. There's not much use for them unless you're doing lots of uh, graphics with bullets and stuff. T it's like a typewriter. You take the cursor over for five, six spaces. You hit tab set. Right, tab set. Wow. Now you've set the tab. Now you can take the cursor home. And when you hit the tab key, which is right next to it, you cursor will jump wow. right over to the tab. If you hit it again, what it did is it jumped all the way over to the next tab. It sets the tab for the whole page. Okay. You can go back here and set another tab. I think you can set any number of tabs that you want. Tab set, home. You hit the tab button. Here, it went to the first one, not went to the second one. Okay. I don't know. Not much use for that, I found. And there's a tab clear, works the same way as well. Uh, another grouping of keys up here. There's a, uh, the italic and the flash key, which are little kind of special applications. Okay, italic, flash. It's next to the center row, center page. Oh, well, say you got a character. This is where the invisible space of the Chiron comes in again as well. So go home and type. Um, italic. How do I make that italic? If I just back the cursor up and put it on the first character of, okay, the cursor is now on the eye, and if I hit the italic key, it blows it away. It doesn't like that. It says, wrongo. What you have to do is hit italic first. Then you have to hit space. You have to space it over one. Okay, let's do erase. Italic, space. Now you can type an italic here. Thing, I T A L I C. What that implies, what you may guess, is you cannot have an italic character butted right up against the left hand side of the screen. Right over here. You can't do that. That's right. Because it needs. Take a look. Here, get in close here, but take a look at the uh, the italic cursor. Okay, that is a little code thing, this trapezoidal shaped thing that's yeah, telling. It's straight there because of the camera angle. Yeah. <laughs> it is straight. <laughs> there, there, there we go. Okay. See, that's saying. See, that's a regular old cursor, but when you take it down, now, cur italic is by line, by the way. You can do it line by line. It doesn't have to be a whole page. So I can have uh, regular right there, and then I can have italic. See, the cursor slants a little bit when you do that, and the whole page, oops, okay, there's the space. There's the little code thing that says italic for everything to the right of this. It's going to be italic. You can in, you can insert that. Now watch this. Insert character. Okay, I'm going to insert one character. I'm going to insert a second character. I'm going to insert a third character just for the hell of it. Now I'm going to press the italic button. Okay. Why'd you insert so many? Just for safety. Didn't really have to. Okay, within a line. Now what I have here is. Uh, Pretty frustrating. Okay, those two characters are regular, and the, and the cursor is regular. There's the little code that says "be italic from here on out." There's a space, and now everything is italic. There on it. You can delete the blank space. Okay, you still need one. There's, if you delete the last one, it breaks up. Okay, so you've got to have. You can insert insert character to say to bring it back but it just won't display it if you have the text butted right up against the italic character. It doesn't like that. You've got to have a little space in there. Okay, if I take a space out again, <coughs> delete character, see? 
That's good for simulating simulating Chiron text or uh, not Chiron. Um, Klingon, <laughs> right? Klingon text. Aside from that, not good for much. You can do okay if you insert another character and another italic, you can double it. So now I've got there's one italic character, there's a second italic character. That's about as far as you want to go. Theoretically, you could do that forever. Insert italic, insert italic but it really gets silly after a while. Okay, see how each one is sort of trapezoid shaped? And then as you delete them, you bring it back. Degrees of incline. Now legend has it, you can make it italicized to the left by... Uh, Turn the keyboard on. What? Turn it on? You can italicize to the left by hitting control italic, but that doesn't, well. But, it, but the first character always turns green when you do that. I don't know why that is. So if you want to. Nope. I think if you want to italicize to the left, the type has to be green. <laughs> I have a feeling this is not a feature, this is a bug, but. Uh, if you ever need to italicize to the left in green. Suppose you insert this character and then be italicized. Can you bring it back to normal? Yeah, delete character. Okay. There. There's all the right. Yeah, now what do you want to do? Insert some space, go back One, two. and reverse italicize. Yeah. Turns green. Still green. Yeah. Shoot. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Okay, re-race. Now then. That's italic. Uh flash. Yeah, flash. Oops. Who needs it? F. Oh, yeah. Flash. Right. So here's what flash does. You put the. You put the. Uh, <coughs> flash. Flash. Okay. You put the cursor on the first character of the word. You press the flash button, and only that word flashes. Okay. okay. And you put it on the second one, and you press flash, and they both flash. And you go back, and you turn off the first one by pressing flash again. Generally <coughs> speaking, this is a silly effect, and uh, should be. Avoided. Enough said. Enough said. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, if you have to forget something, see, they say that people forget a lot of what they hear, so we throw that in so you can forget it. <laughs> um, tabs, centering, read. Okay. We're ready to record something. Now you may say, what good is all this if I can't save it? Well, you can save it, and you save it on the disk drive. Save it on the disk drive, the same disk drive from whence the program came, but not on the same disk. Go over to the disk drive, turn it on. Let's show them how to, let's do this, because we turned it off because we weren't using it before, but we're going to use it again now. We're going to turn it on. We're going to go over to drive one. We're going to pull out the program disk. Program disk, not a message disk. Not a message, excuse me, not a message disk. It's a pro program disk. This is a message disk. Okay, how do you tell the difference? It's not real easy. It just says message on it somewhere, probably. And uh, there, see, it says message or general use. Or it doesn't say program, more likely is a good bet. Well, you can read and write tab. Sorry. Yeah, oh, and the read and write tab, yeah. If it, has, if it has the write tab on it, can't really see that. There, there. Okay. That means you can record. Yeah, if, if this little tab is on there, you can record. If it is not on there, like that, okay, that means you cannot record. And it is not on the program disk, but it is on the message disk. You put it in the same disk drive, number one. You close the thing. First, you go into focus. Okay. And you close, see? Right, put it in. Close the disk drive. And you say, the disk consists of a number of addresses, and you can record stuff on different addresses. You address the disk thusly. You say, oh, disk. No, you, actually, you do it through the keypad. OK, the disks have, uh, apparently, there are hundreds of addresses, but we never really use that many. This four-digit LED display tells you where you are. or tell, No, it doesn't tell you where you are. It tells you where, where you want to go. And I say to it, I want to go to 100, 100. 
and it says 100. And I want to see if there's anything on that disk, so I'm going to hit read. Uh, read is over here. And it says, oh, wow, there's something there. It says workers' compensation underwriting training. Nope, doesn't work. Uh, so I can't record on page 100 because that's somebody else's graphic. And I don't, heaven forbid, I should uh, blow away somebody's graphic. I'll get in big trouble. Okay. Well, how about 200? No message found. Okay. Hold Let's it. take a look at that. I said 200, read. And it says, no message found, 200 is blank. That's great, we'll use it. Whenever a prompt on the bottom of the thing flashes at you, whenever there's a flashing prompt, there's only one way to stop the flashing prompt, and that is by pressing the space bar, okay? So anything that flashes at you, the only way to stop it is to press the space bar. So we're gonna record something on page 200. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna hit we're going to hit clear address, which is this thingy here. And that made this all zeros. We have 200. Okay. And I'm going to go up and create something to record. What shall we create? Oh, let's make it say um, this is page. No? Oh. You want to stop and do an edit? All right. Okay, I'm going to bring, I'm going to insert a couple rows. Oops. Delete row. Home. Insert row, insert row. Insert. And center row. Oops, center page. Center page. I'm going to take the cursor. Here's the cursor. Take the cursor over to the last character, which since I centered the page, I created those weird characters, right? Hit spacebar and get rid of it. Um, why don't you zoom in on that? Because here's what we're, we're going to put a record mark there. Now, a record mark is a thing that's going to tell the Chiron start at the upper left, the home position, and record up until you see that record mark and then stop. Record mark button is down here. Okay. R -E R C D mark. Okay, now when I press that button, I won't do it just yet. Go back to the cursor. Okay, see, it leaves behind a little cursor like thing. I'm moving the cursor away, and it leaves this translucent character as uh, two stripes. And it's, uh, that's the record mark. It will record everything between the cursor and the record mark. So the cursor has to be home. Let's put the cursor, well, hit home. Okay, cursor's now home. It'll record all this, and it'll stop at the record mark. And it'll do that when I press this button, record. It's a red button, and it's far away from everything else, and that's for a reason, because it's only to be used when you're serious. You only press that button when you want to record something. And it says recording, and it finished, and it's, you're done. The okay, the numbers, the LED numbers advance over here. They advance to the next page automatically. Now it says 201. Yeah, you can almost see it there. Okay. Okay, now I'm going to erase the page, and I'm going to call back what we recorded. I'm going to clear the address. I'm going to type in 200. I'm going to hit read. Bang. Brings it back. Okay. Now, here's another thing to note. If I hit erase, the cursor goes home. If I hit, then I go clear address 200. Clear address 200, read. Okay. It did that because the cursor was already home when I did that. If I had the cursor somewhere else in the frame, say if I had the cursor sort of in the middle, if the cursor is not home, it's going to play it back from that position relative. So 200, read. It brought it back down here, see? 
It didn't bring it back in the same place on the screen. So home is a good reference point. Just make sure, make sure you record things with the cursor in the home position. Make sure you play them back with the cursor in the home, or read them out, is a better phrase, with the cursor in the home position, otherwise you can get screwed up. It's economical to put the record mark there. Uh, if you don't put a record mark, if I just had, well, if I just said uh, this, well, let's make this uh, here. This is page 201. Okay, center page, insert row, insert row. Okay. Right now the cursor is home. I don't have a record mark. If I hit record, yeah, it'll record, but it'll, it'll assume the record mark is off the bottom of the screen somewhere. Um, so, well, in advanced Chiron, this is bad. I mean, as far as this goes, it's just good habit, good practice to use the record mark. Um, what it is is saving space on the disk. It saves space on the disk, okay. It doesn't record any more than it has to. Right. Okay, let's, so let's do that. Now I'm going to put another record mark. Okay, now notice the, the funky cursor again because when I hit center page, it creates these big spaces. If I hit record mark, it'll leave one in there. You know, you know, and that's okay, it's legit. A record mark can be any size. Go home. That's the record mark. That's the cursor. And 201, record. Oops, disk, oh. Disk 100% full, no it's not. <laughs> Some bitch. Or, come on, hey, turkey. Okay, well, anyway, it would have recorded on page two. What is there? <laughs> Three. Every once in a while it gets temperamental, close to the end of the day. Well, we're gonna make an edit now. <laughs> and uh, come back later. <laughs>